Today, I want to talk about global grasslands and some of the work that I've been doing in grasslands to ask and answer, well, trying to answer big questions. So I want to start by talking about grasslands. So grasslands occur now on every continent. You can think about that with Antarctica. Um, they cover approximately 40% of Earth's ice-free land surface. We rely on grasslands for services and products that are critical to our survival as humans. Wherever we go, we create grasslands and use grasslands for people. In fact, on every continent except Antarctica, we have cleared forests and created grasslands where grasslands didn't exist before. And so understanding global grasslands and changes, the dynamics in these grasslands, is really important for predicting and understanding what future Earth will look like. But it's also really important as we think about how we'll manage grasslands into the future. And so what are some of the myriad changes that are happening in grasslands? One of them is because of the Haber-Bosch process and the generation of an enormous amount of uh, inorganic nitrogen, um, fertilizer since about 1950, fertilizer production has increased by about 400%. And it's, it's measurable in ice cores. We are fundamentally changing Earth's nitrogen cycle. And that is changing nutrients coming into all environments, including grasslands. We're also changing the location, identity, um, and the domination of herbivores in different landscapes. So um, we have replaced native herbivores here, this is elk, uh, with a very narrow range of domestic herbivores. So cattle, sheep, and a few other herbivores on various different continents. But we are replacing these natives and moving them off to edges changing the density and identity of these consumers. Okay, so those are just two of the changes, but there are many different types of changes. I'm really trying to invoke this idea that, you know, we're changing nitrogen at local scales, but it's having global impacts. That nitrogen is going up into the atmosphere, moving elsewhere, and coming down in rain um, in some locations more than others. We are clearing uh, and creating pasture and rangeland around the world. So this is just the aggregate map of many individual choices, decisions about land use change. And this is just really to invoke this idea that we are changing the composition of herbivores as well. So something really important to notice about these maps is we are changing many things, but they are not changing in lockstep. So at any one point on Earth, there are different combinations of these factors, these changes that are happening, different rates of change and direction of change. And so we have these multiple changes that are happening and possibly even interacting with each other. So for example, if nitrogen is coming into a grassland, and herbivores prefer nitrogen-rich plants. Maybe the herbivores are eating more plant. We don't know. We don't know what that looks like around the world. And so one really big question that bothers me is how will Earth's grasslands respond to increased nutrient supply and changing consumer density and identity? Will these interact with one another? What will that look like? OK, so now. I want to segue to how we do our science. So how would I answer that question? Well, for me, I'm deeply empirical. I'm motivated by theory. I'm interested in testing theory. But my corner that I fall back to is go out in the field and do an experiment. OK, so I'm standing at the top of a hill at Cedar Creek. <laughs> that is elevation. Um, right, so I'm looking down the hill. <laughs> I just have to point out to you guys that that is a hill, so there you go. Um, I'm looking down the hill at an experiment, and I have manipulated these factors, right, because that's what I do. 
I've got, you know, over here, I have a plot where I dumped a whole bunch of fertilizer. I'm like, oh, wow, look at that. It's really big, it's dense, it's green. Something's different in that plot compared to this plot next to it, right? I have these two plots and I look and I'm like, whoa, all right, fertilizer's really changing what's going on in this field. That's really important, right? We, that we're seeing changes in the composition, we're seeing changes in the productivity of these grasslands. And I, you know, I'll maybe look inside of the fences and find something similar, right? I, I find these results at my site, and now I'm going to bare my soul to you and tell you what keeps me awake at night, which is, can I scale up? Can I take my plots unit in plant ecology, right? I throw down my quadrat and I measure those plants. And maybe I find differences between the plants in one plot and another, and then I say there's a difference, okay? So what can I know about the field I work in? <laughs> can I say something and make some prediction about what will happen in some other part of my field? Well, maybe, right? And then I go to downtown St. Paul where I've got, you know, the regulators and the, you know, that's the capital of the state. Minneapolis is not. So downtown St. Paul and, you know, someone will say, great, so tell us what we now know about global change in Minnesota. And I'll be like, show me the door, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I can say from my changes in these one square meter plots about what's going to happen in Minnesota. I mean, for goodness sake, we've got like three or four biomes in the state, but you know, even if I restrict what I'm saying to grassland biomes, I still like, I don't know, maybe Cedar Creek's different than other places. And so I get pretty nervous. It keeps me awake at night wondering, what can I then say about global change? <laughs> what do I know from my study at Cedar Creek? Okay, and it's not that we don't have other tools, right? We've got lots of tools in our trade one is meta-analysis, right? Lots of people have done studies in other places in the world, like in Europe, I can find studies where people have dumped fertilizer and done similar things to me, measured the plants, looked at the response. I can maybe find those in a handful of other places, right? Hundreds of people at this point have dumped fertilizer on plants and measured something about them. Okay, so I pulled together hundreds of studies. Ooh, but there's limitations with meta-analysis. Everybody uses different methods. You go to Europe, they mow twice a year. They don't say that in their methods in every paper, right? And so what, how do I then compare those studies between what's happening at Cedar Creek and maybe what's happening in a mowed grassland in Central Europe? I don't know, right? And so that's a real challenge that we're faced with. How do we make inference about these scales that are much larger than what, where we're working? All right, another tool we've got, ecological theory. Thank God for mathematicians, right? They are helping us figure out about generality. We can take these very complex systems and talk to a mathematician and suddenly it's like three parameters and you, know, you can come up with some awesome analytical solution and that's great, right? And so we can, <laughs> I love theory, all right. <laughs> but it's, it's a really useful tool to help us generalize, to say, okay, we have these results in some locations, these other results in other locations, right? What can we know from that? Can we then extend that and make predictions about what might happen in some other location? But there are limitations there as well, right? We are losing a lot of the realism to simplify down to that handful of parameters. So how do we learn about the world? And I would not say that we have you know, there is a silver bullet, there is a single tool, but I would say that we need other tools than what we have in our toolbox right now. So backing back out to maps of the world, let's think about that a little bit further, right? So I'm doing my work at one location, Cedar Creek. That location has this particular combination of nitrogen deposition, and altered grazing rates. And one of the things that I see when I look at these maps is not just projections forward in time, wow, there's gonna be a whole lot more nitrogen coming down on Earth in 2050. That's one thing I take away. But the other thing that I take away is, wow, it's gonna be massively variable 
how much is coming into any one point on Earth. So if, for example, I were to go to India or go to Central Australia, I would find a different combination of grazing rates of herbivory in general, so both uh, agriculture and non-agricultural animals, but I would also find really different rates of nitrogen coming down in these locations, right? And so how do I make inference? How do I make projections and say, well, yeah, of course, what happens at Cedar Creek? Like, that's what, that's what our literature looks like, right? We write these conclusions, we're like, yeah, and this applies to everybody else too, the end, right? But do we really believe that? I don't. And it worries me. <laughs> all right, so what do we really need? We need a replicated experiment that's done under all of these different conditions. And this is what we're now doing. So this is the nutrient network. Um, it's actually about four sites old because I made the map a couple months ago. <laughs> But this is an experiment that's being replicated exactly identically at all of those dots, sampling the same way and applying the same treatments under a vast array of Earth's conditions, grassland conditions. Not all of these are the natural grassland biome, but all of these are done in herbaceous dominated systems. Some of them are human created but we still want to understand those. Those are not something we want to just reject because we made them, right? And so we are repeating the exact same experiment under all these conditions. And I just want to point out that that is Peter Adler right there. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, yes, that is an elephant over there. <laughs> um, and this is the very top of the uh, Himalayas. So we have sites that span this vast array of conditions, both herbivores and nutrients, as well as different uh, evolutionary histories of the plants, vastly different geology and geologic history of the regions. And so we want to understand what's general and what's contingent on the conditions of that site. And we can't ask that truly, even using meta-analysis. We need to have exactly replicated experiments. So here's what this experiment looks like. We have three different data sets that are being generated at every site. The first one is observational. We just go out, we use identical methods to collect data on the plant cover, the composition, total above ground biomass. We all sample soils and everybody sends them to me and then I pay for them all and run them through my lab. Um, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know what I was signing up for when I started this project. I thought I was gonna be like six sites. So anyway, um, so that's the observational data set. We have a multi-nutrient experiment. So we have nitrogen, phosphorus, and then potassium and micronutrients. So three treatments that are combined in a factorial combination. And then what we call the top down, bottom up. So the idea here is we add all nutrients and no nutrients inside and outside of fences to remove those herbivores. And that is the experiment that I will focus on today. Um, it's actually been great to put this together. I have not synthesized these results together before, so um, it's new to me too, <laughs> um, what I've learned in putting this together. What we cut, uh, I talked about this, but in word, <laughs> in, on the slide here, uh, cover of each, splant, each species, live plant mass and litter. We also have collected light interception, so above the canopy and at ground level. And we did that because we could, and it has turned into an incredibly important covariate to understand some of the responses in these grasslands. And I'll show you some of that um, in just a moment. We also use knowledge at the site level of whether a plant is native or non-native to that site. A lot of the work that's been done on invasive species relies on floras, floras of a region or even a continent. Um, and what we've done is we now have expert knowledge, but we also have the total cover of each of those species. So it, we are able to gain insights into invasive species as well. I won't talk about that as much today. 
Um, and then we have soil texture and chemistry from the pre-treatment year, and then approximately three to five years later, people have sent soils and we process those. At this point, we have about one, well, between one and 10 years of data at all of those sites. Um, sites can add in at any time, just saying there's no site in Utah, um, but Peter Adler has one at Sheep Station in uh, Idaho. So, you know, everybody's doing it. Um, <laughs> so this is the design uh, in a picture. So this factorial combination of nutrients by fencing. And this is what it looks like at uh, one site. This is a site in Colorado. All right, so that map in words and numbers, we have currently 136 sites. So 100 of those are contributing all of the different data types, both experiments and the observational data. Um, 26 of them were only able to go in one time. For example, I had a site when I was on faculty at Oregon State. I thought I was gonna take students there and I got to that site and I was up to my ears in Poison Oak and decided that that was not gonna be the best educational site. <laughs> so that one became an observation only site. But those data have been incredibly valuable to just have plant composition collected in identical ways um, in grasslands around the world. So we've gained huge insights. Peter Adler actually led a paper in 2011 that used that data set to great effect. Um, and then 10 sites have retired. We haven't had that many retirements over the last decade, but some sites have had to um, either be sold or for whatever reason, PIs moved institutions. Um, it spans 27 countries, six continents. We don't yet have the grassland that is developing in Antarctica. There's a two species grassland. Yeah, you can cry a little bit about that. Um, and it spans 131 degrees of latitude. So from Tierra del Fuego to Svalbard in Norway. So we are truly capturing the range of conditions. And I'll show you that in a minute. It's not just the number of sites, it's actually the range of conditions that I find most exciting about this data set. So again, uniform data and about 2,500 uh, plant taxa, which to my great joy, recently bumped up over about 1% of Earth's non-tree vascular plant flora, which I find just astounding. And as sites are adding in in new regions of the world, that's increasing. Um, and it turns out we are working in grasslands, so poaceae are grasses, um, and we've captured about 4% of all known grasses just in this data set of one square meter plots at sites. Okay, so we got all this cool data. <laughs> what are we answering? So today what I wanna focus in on are questions about the interactions, the potential interactions and measures of interactions between nutrients and herbivores. So asking about how that controls plant production, plant composition, I'll talk a little bit about soils, plant chemistry. What are we finding here? And it turns out, well, I'm not gonna tell you what turns out yet. So I'm gonna start with this. So this is a diagram from a paper led by Stan Harpel in 2017, um, looking at the various pathways by which nutrients, and I add in the herbivores, could impact plant communities. So how could these act singly or in combination to change the composition uh, and mass productivity of those plant communities? So nutrients, Maybe they cause greater rates of photosynthesis and photosynthetic capture um, of energy and turning it into biomass of plants. That may change conditions, may change, some are, may, species may be better competitors for the, those nutrients, right? So it may change the composition of the community. It may change the chemistry of the community, the amount of litter, but also how much dead plant mass, dead litter, uh, is remaining may be dependent on the chemistry of that litter. May de determine the amount of light available to small seedlings, right? Will we lose certain species that we could predict based on their stature, right? If you're shrimpy and there's lots of big plants that are taking advantage of all of that nutrient availability and they are shading you out, 
are those the species we lose, right? So can we make predictions about compositional change, uh, thinking about light? And again, you could think the herbivores as well. They may be responding, for example, to nutrient-enriched biomass. It's yummier, right? It's higher in terms of nutrition, greater protein content. They may change the light availability, right? So maybe plants in the absence of herbivores capture lots of light, but the herbivores then consume some of that plant, releasing the sh short plants from that light competition. Herbivores may alter diversity. Some herbivores are highly selective in what they eat. Right? So they may change the composition of the community through their selection. They may also change the diversity of the community, either directly or indirectly, through a variety of pathways. Right? So we can think about a lot of different ways that these may interact. And my first fallback when I try to come up with a hypothesis is I look at old theory. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, somebody probably figured this out in like 1975. Let's look at the theory and see what we might expect. So starting with this fairly straightforward starting point of trophic cascade theory, right? So this idea that plants in the absence of consumers can take advantage of all of the nutrients available and nobody's eating them. You add in an herbivore and it takes advantage of all that yummy plant, reducing the standing stock of the plant. And then you add in a predator and the predator eats the herbivore and the, right, so I don't know why she swallowed the flat, right? So you can, add, you can keep doing this um, until you run out of all the sunlight energy that could possibly make it through. Um, mathematically, it just looks like this. This, this over here, is the same as this, more or less. It's just with the math uh, infrastructure holding it up. Okay, so we make these same predictions across a gradient of productivity. So how much nutrient, maybe? <laughs> productivity is a very difficult word to measure when you get into the field. How are we gonna measure that? Is that total amount of carbon capture per unit time? Or is it total amount of mass of plant, right? We can go there, but I'll, let's do it during the questions. Um, but you can make these predictions about increasing productivity leading to increasing total amount of standing mass up to a point at which uh, herbivores are present in the system and then carnivores are present in the system, right? So leading to these alternating states. These are predictions that I can start with when I'm thinking about, okay, what should I look for? What should I test when I go out into the field and I've got like maybe 130 sites of data? <laughs> What's my starting point to test for? There's a lot of other theory that I'm not gonna walk through, but that we can use to make a priori predictions about what we might expect in the field. So we can use stoichiometric theory where we're thinking about the ratio and rate of elemental nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, maybe potassium and micronutrients coming into that system and what's captured in that system, right? So there's whole bodies of theory that we can use to make predictions that might begin to answer some of those questions. And then we can go and we can test that. If we had a single site, we could do a test of theory, a demonstration that theory maybe has some grounding in reality, right? So at a single site. But once we have many sites, we can start asking about context dependence. We can start asking about when is this theory relevant? Are there conditions under which this is telling us more than other conditions? So we can start to understand things that we can't without a structure like this experiment. Okay. Moving on to meta-analysis, another super useful tool as a starting point, right? So look across the literature, gather up all the possible studies. So this is a study that I was involved in, published about a decade ago, that really began. So you know the publication date is not when we started thinking about this, right? So publication date after when Nutrient Network, Network started, but the genesis of this idea and the beginnings of collecting these data this was what pointed out to us that we needed something like the nutrient network. So what we have here is a comparison of freshwater 
marine and terrestrial systems, and we were asking about whether herbivores or nutrients control the total mass here of plants in a system. So when we remove herbivores or add nutrients, do we see a change in the total mass of plants? Now hone in over here into this terrestrial system, and you can see, turns out, when we fertilize, we get more plants. That's a relief. <laughs> we kind of knew that. Um, but what's interesting is there's a really wide amount of variance, a lot of variance associated with the effect of herbivores. Mm, overlapping zero in the meta-analysis, but some studies finding really big effects. But really, frankly, not enough data to really parse apart when we see effects and when we don't. And one of the really useful things about meta-analysis is to point out what we don't know, what we haven't yet published. So one of the things we learned from putting this meta-analysis together is that about 4% of all of the studies that have been done looking at these herbivore plant uh, nutrient uh, interactions, only about 4% had been done in terrestrial systems. We all expected that it would be much higher. We're like, our perception is that you know, there was this vast literature on that. It turns out a lot of that was in lakes and marine systems. OK, the other thing that we found, which really surprised us, is it was almost all bugs. I love bugs. But we were really lacking an understanding in what was happening with the vertebrates and what those potential interactions were with the nutrients and herbivores. and so. What you see here is not only learning about what are the patterns across the literature, but also learning about what we don't yet know. And so with Nutrient Network, we decided to fill that gap, to do this experiment and ask, what do we see when we study terrestrial systems and vertebrate herbivores with nutrients? OK, so pan back to the nutrient network, these are just conditions under which we have sites. So frequency diagrams, uh, the number of sites on the y-axis for all of these, climate, so rainfall and temperature, a really vast range, right? So we go from very, very arid desert systems, 250 millimeters of rain or any precipitation all year, right? All the way out to I can't even remember what our highest one is now. It's in the Western Ghats of India, and it's something like three meters of rain a year. <laughs> it just makes me start molding thinking about it. Um, right, so really a globally relevant range of conditions. Uh, rainfall, temperature, this is across degrees of latitude, uh, elevation, species richness, total amount of mass uh, in the plots soil phosphorus and soil nitrogen, um, and then proportion of exotic species and total exotic cover. Right, so we've got this really wide range of conditions, and on top of that, we're overlaying exactly the same experiment. So we can now ask, under what conditions do we see certain outcomes? All right, I realized last night when it was too late to really doing any, anything about it, that I don't have any cool pictures of kudu, and I don't have any great pictures of caribou. So sorry, um, if you wanted that, you can, <laughs> that's just kind of the end. Um, but we have this really vastly wide range, not only of plant conditions and abiotic conditions, but of herbivores around the world. So the dominant herbivores in our plots include kangaroos. I do have a picture of the kangaroo. That's right, guinea pigs. Who knew? There are wild guinea pigs. I've gone to Argentina twice now, and I have not yet seen those darned guinea pigs. They keep promising them, so I have to go back again. But wild guinea pigs as one of the dominant herbivores in some of the grasslands. Um, you know, two more standard <laughs> herbivores that you might expect in global grasslands. Um, but this vastly wide array of herbivores. So when I went into this study, I was the person that caucused for the fences. And I had a lot of misgivings because I thought, wow, with this range of herbivores, we might get noise, <laughs> like nothing. 
right? It worried me that maybe we wouldn't have any effect of all of that skin that we took off when we put up the fences. <laughs> um, but it, that's not the case. So here's productivity. I'm going to have uh, the broad response variable in green on the left-hand side of these slides. These are the treatments. So the fencing's treatment, comparing uh, inside and outside of the fence, the nutrient treatment with and without the nutrients, and then the interaction. So asking, do herbivores eat more of fertilized plants, for example, right? So that's what we're answering with this interaction. And what we, one of the things that we can do at this point is we now have about a decade of data at a whole lot of sites. We can start to ask our short-term responses on an NSF type scale of three years, similar to or predictive of long-term responses, maybe out a decade or more. At least in this case, the answer is yeah, they actually are. So, um, but we still want more money. Um, so on the y-axis here, right, live biomass change, I'm not that surprised that when we fertilize, we get more plant, right? That wasn't like earth shattering. But the thing that amazed me in these data is that when we put up a fence, even when it's like guinea pigs, rabbits, and you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever herbivore you choose uh, depends on your latitude, we have a global signal of more plant mass when we remove those herbivores. So herbivores have really thought, been thought in a lot of grassland ecology to not matter that much. We can kind of ignore them. It turns out that that's really not the case. They really matter in terms of plant uh, biomass, total amount of mass. We do see what looks like, stay tuned for like five more years, but what looks like there may be some kind of interaction that's developing. So there's actually less plant uh, that is inside of these fences through time. That's not intuitive. I suspect that may be about nutrient recycling, standing dead, and the non-trophic effects of some of these herbivores, trampling and bringing plants into contact with the microbes that truly do the decomposition. But stay tuned, that's me totally getting ahead, putting the cart before the horse. Okay, another thing that we see is contingency. So on these slides, I will highlight conditions in orange. So in this case, on the y-axis, this is the change in biomass, the change inside and outside of fences. That change is greatest where there's low temperature variability and where there's a wet growing season. So under certain conditions that have to do with, for example, aridity, rainfall, maybe potential or actual evapotranspiration, but we're seeing these conditions mattering and under other conditions, we don't really see a strong effect of herbivores. So we have identified, in this case, some of those conditions. OK, what about nutrients in, those bio, in that biomass? This is a paper that just came out, uh, whatever, a handful of months ago by Michael Anderson. What we see here is that fertilization by nitrogen, by phosphorus, and by potassium changes the total mass nutrient content. So if I were to mow through all of those plants and stick them in an elemental analyzer, which is more or less what we did in this study, what would we find? What we found is that the fertilizer effect on total nitrogen in the, abs sorry, in the presence of herbivores here in these solid gray, nope, I'm sorry, in the absence of herbivores, sorry, in the solid gray here, in the absence of herbivores, we see a very strong effect of climate. This is precipitation, uh, mean annual precipitation on the x-axis. But when we add herbivores in, they eat it, right? So at these low precipitation sites, herbivores are removing that high nitrogen mass. They're seeking it out, particularly in drier sites. We don't have quite as much replication at those high ends, so I can't tell you as much about the super high precipitation end of that line. But we have much better replication in this low to mid range. Okay, what about soil carbon, right? So let's get ecosystem here. 
Surely there's someone that loves soil carbon out here. Um, what I have here on the y-axis is the fertilized and unfertilized, the change inside and outside of the fence. Right? So the change that happens when we remove herbivores. What happens to soil nitrogen in fertilized plots? It declines. It's not necessarily what I would have expected. In fertilized plots, soil nitrogen, sorry, did I just say nitrogen? Carbon and nitrogen both decline when we remove the herbivores. Again, I suspect, and we haven't gotten to test this yet, but I suspect this may be some of the non-trophic effects of the herbivores, trampling down that vegetation, making that nutrient cycling go faster when they're present. Okay, what about plant diversity? Well, turns out uh, when we fertilize these plots, as we've found in lots of meta-analyses, it's kind of a relief to find it again when we do it uh, as a replicated experiment. We see a loss in the total richness. So this is nutrients added. We see about one and a half species per meter squared lost across this uh, entire experiment. When we put up a fence, again, this is like a little depressing to me because there's a lot of work to put up these fences. I found no net effect of herbivores. But then I started thinking, okay, well, there might be differences in the kinds of herbivores or something about herbivore effects in these different systems. So I dug into the data further. One of the things we found, sorry, I was getting ahead of myself. One of the things we found though is this is non, a non-random loss of species. So this is a follow-up study that uh, Eric Siebelum led here using the same x-axis. So the change in species richness when we add fertilizer or fences we lose native species. Exotic species, no net change in the non-natives. But we're losing native species. Okay, so there's a compositional change here that's being affected by the nutrients. Okay, now, looking at this contingency, at sites where putting up a fence reduces light at ground level, we see a loss in species. That doesn't happen everywhere, right? So where herbivores are removing some of that mass of plant, providing light at ground level, we have maintenance of diversity. We lose it when those herbivores at those sites are lost. But the herbivores are interacting with the site conditions. And so it's under those conditions that we see loss of diversity. What's really interesting is, again, Following that up, Eric uh, Siebloom's paper, um, he found that that's primarily because of change in native species, so that loss of native species. Those native species are being lost in sites where herbivores have been removing mass and increasing light at ground level. So next, what we need to do is go in and measure stature, right, height. Is there something about light competition that we can measure through traits? Stay tuned. All right, so what about compositional change? I want to think about compositional change. This is something that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, foliar sodium. I like salt, but one of the things that I think is really interesting is that plants don't care for the most part until it gets very high. Plants, for the most part, except for a few C4 grasses, don't use sodium. They don't require it. It's not metabolically required by them. But they're really poor at excluding it because it's so similar to potassium, which they need, that they often end up with higher sodium content uh, just based on supply in the environment. Okay, so one of the things that when we think about foliar sodium, we often think, well, that's gonna be a function of the soil. But it might also be a function of distance to coast, how much salt is coming down in the rain, how many ions are coming into the system. It could be a function of a lot of things. We don't really have a good biogeographic understanding of what determines sodium in plants. But we now have a data set in which we were able to look at that. So these are all 201 species arrayed out from lowest sodium to highest sodium. These are dominant species in plots in the nutrient network. 
and measured out foliar sodium. So it runs from phleum pretense, which was the lowest sodium content, a grass, all the way through to Apaltes australis, which is like a sodium loving species. It is really, it does very well in arid systems um, in Australia, okay? We found that foliar sodium, if we only include soil sodium in the models, foliar sodium increases with soil sodium. But as soon as we include other factors, large biogeographic factors like aridity, the soil sodium drops out. So what we see, this aridity index is confusing because to the left is dry and to the right is wet. So the a high value for aridity, the aridity index means it's wet. Right, so sorry, but that's what it is. <laughs> I didn't make it up. What we find here is this solid line, which is the average across a whole lot of these sites. We see a decline in foliar sodium with a decline in aridity or increasing water coming into a site. That is a much better predictor of foliar sodium. But wait, there's more because it turns out that the herbivores are selectively consuming high nutrient, high sodium plants. So on the y axis here is species abundance, on the x axis is foliar sodium. So I just took those same species and I arrayed them out across that x axis. The control plots are shown in red, the nutrient plots that are open to herbivores are shown in purple. Sorry, the nutrient plots that are inside of fences, so not accessible to herbivores, are shown in purple. Uh, the green sites, so inside a fence, right? So either not fertilized or not accessible to herbivores. But when you fertilize those plots, think higher protein content. And at that point, the herbivores come in and selectively remove those plants that have the highest foliar sodium. Picture your bowl of salted caramel ice cream. <laughs> it's my favorite kind of ice cream, right? It's high salt, high protein. And I think that's what's going on and determining these large biogeographic patterns of foliar sodium in plants. There are so many more elements out there. I can't wait to start doing this with other elements and thinking about what is the biogeography and do herbivores have any role in this? when we think about plant biogeography. Okay, so I have walked you through some big general patterns and some patterns that are quite contingent, primarily on abiotic factors or interactions between herbivores and those abiotic factors, often associated with aridity or precipitation, which I think is a really interesting next step to start thinking about. But we see that these effects herb of herbivores on grassland plants, is contingent on climate and nutrient supply. And so to me, that's a really cool emergent property that we are able to capture with this experiment. And so in terms of big messages, one of the things I wanna leave you with is we use theory to guide these hypotheses. Otherwise, we would be fishing through this enormous data set without a priori hypotheses. And so we use that theory to guide our predictions and then to test them and with this data set, we can figure out where that breaks. What don't we yet know? What haven't we yet incorporated into our understanding of grassland plant dynamics? And so using this distributed collaborative experiment, we have the kind of data that allow us to make that sort of test. And I would add to that that we can look at these big biogeographic patterns like those in foliar sodium and start to make sense of them. So we can not only document them, but start to understand them in the context of our experimental uh, manipulations. And so even more broadly, thinking about this collaborative network, right? You may not care about grasslands. You may not even care about nutrients. <laughs> I don't know why not. But if you didn't, this is still a method that I think is a new tool we can really use as ecologists to think about global change to think about when should we worry, why should we worry, are there conditions under which we don't need to worry about future changes on Earth. And so with these multifactorial studies, we can uh, use this as a platform to ask whole new questions as well. So I hope that you can, you know, even if you don't care about any of the content of this talk, you can take that away as you can do it. 
we did it. I was a, whatever, second year faculty member at the time working with postdocs. Um, and so one of the things I find most exciting about this is instead of saying, is it top down? Is it bottom up? You know, is it herbivores or is it nutrients? Or, you know, we can start to not only ask about the interactions because we have this multifactorial study, but we can also ask under what conditions does this matter? Is it a wet, warm environment where we see the greatest effects? Is there something else about that environment? Um, and so we can answer how much and when and where. Um, and we can move beyond this single site theory demonstration. Yes, theory and my experiment at my site matched up. That's super exciting. Don't get me wrong, I get super excited when that happens. But with this kind of a network, we also can start asking about, is this general? It happened at my site, but maybe some other geologic history or phylogenetic you know, lineage, evolutionary lineage of plants, maybe we would get a really different response. Right? So we can ask about both generality and importance. Does it really matter? And so with that, I need to thank Jennifer Fern, who uh, has been leading the charge and uh, looking at foliar traits. Uh, Ashley Asmus and Eric Lind, who have been the uh, data managers and uh, brilliant postdocs on this project. Uh, and Eric Seabloom, who is my co-conspirator in leading this whole network. Um, and then this is just the, uh, the group that was working on the foliar traits um, at a workshop that we had uh, in Germany. And Thank you to a bunch of funders. Um, may you continue to fund me. Um, <laughs> and with that, I'd be happy to take questions. The identity. Yeah. How yeah. Trampling, litter size, you know, all that would be influenced by your body size, gut, you know, gut retention time, all that stuff. Yes. The herbivores and the evolutionary history and the soils vary at sites around the world. And so sorting those apart would truly require some replication within those regions to begin to ask that. We don't have the power to do that. But one of the things that we have started to do is look at, for example, patterns of litter to live, right? So looking at those ratios and asking, does the dominant herbivore body size, is that a reasonable covariate, right? So we can't really, this, this is imperfect like all of our different ways of studying the earth, right? Um, and so that's one of the ways in which we don't have replication within a region um, or like where there's lots of Cape Buffalo and lots of guinea pigs. But <laughs> I still don't believe there's guinea pigs there. But anyway, um, we are starting to try to come at that from the other side and asking about patterns of litter to live and if climate or herbivores or other factors, soils, um, are relevant uh, as predictors, at least within our data set. Yeah. Yeah, that's an um, excellent question. One of the things that we decided to do at the outset of this project was make it everybody's side project. So I didn't even talk about the genesis of this network, but we decided we would make it everybody's side project, have it be relatively low cost, have it be relatively low cost in terms of time as well. So dollars or pesos or whatever you're spending um, and people, hours. Um, and that was a choice that we decided to do is to only sample at peak biomass each year. And so that's investigator determined based on the mass or whatever, the growth and phenology of the system. But we, for the most part, don't have phenological measurements uh, within the site. So looking at first emergence, things like that. That said, this network has been used in a lot of ways as a platform for other studies and a platform for education. 
And so there are certain sites where, for example, an undergraduate will go out and do an undergraduate thesis project where they track. I have a graduate student who at a single site is doing really intensive measurements of some ecosystem properties. So there are sites that are accessible and people go to and use, but at a, the network scale, our core sampling is just at peak biomass. Yeah. Yeah, Michael. So finer temporal scale. Okay, yes, um, absolutely. So I'm showing you summary slides of data. That's, there's a lot of data behind these dots. Um, um, excuse me. Yes, I decided that for a variety of reasons, one of which was data spatial coverage. So space and time are linked in this network data set because sites can add in at any point. So a Utah site can start this year, for example, just saying. Um, and it would still be really, you know, it would just follow the same trajectory of sampling. So that two to three year window gave me a lot of sites. And I found that that split of you know, two to three and six to eight were kind of sweet spots really in terms of data density. Um, and that was my choice was to think, okay, well that's gonna give me some spread in time and maximize data density that I've got across space. So it was pragmatic as much as anything. Um, but certainly, I mean, there are so many analyses of these data going on, um, but yes, looking at trends and trajectories and asking if that's contingent on site conditions or you know, something biotic or abiotic is certainly happening. There's a lot of work going on in drought, actually, looking at the site scale uh, through time. Yeah. Tell me what you mean um, about the processing. Yeah. Pee and poo? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Just to be clear. <laughs> All right, well, I didn't know, you know, there's lots of ways they can. Um, that is a potential. Um, we've, at a subset of sites, people have looked at whether there is um, dung or whatever it might be um, in the plots. Um, that's harder because we're only looking really at one point in the year and so it may fully decompose by the time we or be not identifiable as such by the time we get there in the year. So um, there are a few sites that have done camera trapping to try to assess how much they're actually physically in the plot. Um, yes, I think that there's a lot that's open in terms of what the role of the herbivores are. The thing that I find really surprising though is that some of these results are in the opposite direction that I would have expected. And that's where I kind of, you know, follow my nose and I start thinking that's the next thing we need to really pursue is why is that not what my gut tells me it should be? You know, like why, why isn't it? And so maybe nutrient recycling, maybe trampling, maybe, you know, there's a lot of hypotheses to be tested um, to try to sort that apart. So yes, maybe that's one hypothesis. Yep. Do you have any sense of whether that's actually important? 
Um, so can I go really small in terms of spatial scale instead of the really big first? So what, one thing that we got really excited about is thinking about some of the theory that's been coming out recently looking at species diversity at different spatial scales. So it addresses that conceptually, but not at the scale you're thinking about. So we have come up with, I think I'm gonna coin this, I'm gonna try to figure out the cutie quadrat. So it is 10 centimeters on a side, actually a little less than that. Um, you know, like a little bracelet, it's cool. Um, and we take that and we start at that spatial scale in the corner. So truly that is looking at seedling and likely at the spatial scale of actual coexistence and competition and um, you know, some of these things that are more theoretically linked. We then are looking at the one meter scale, then at the two and a half meter scale, then at the five by five, so 25 meter scale, and then summing across all of the plots at the site. So we have several different spatial scales where we can start to look at loss, gain, turnover of species. It's not addressing exactly what you're asking about the spatial scale of the herbivores. We are asking spatially scaled questions though. Um, I don't think that we're, uh, in this network, we are capable of sampling at the you know, 100 by 100 meter and beyond um, in terms of doing the plant assessments. So we probably won't go there, but we are looking at some of these theoretically underpinned questions of spatial scale. So do you have a sense whether you're getting different answers from the different scales that you have? Um, can I tell you in a year? <laughs> we haven't gotten the data yet. <laughs> we just rolled it out a year ago, and so the data are now starting to come in. We just asked people, hey, if you think the spatial scale is cool, you wanna do this too? It'll add, you know, whatever, an hour or two to your site sampling. And so, I don't know yet, but I really wanna know. <laughs> Super curious. All right, so I think that concludes. Uh, everybody, please thank Elizabeth again.